Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to your Money Momentum podcast. My name is Tom Kennedy, Global Wealth Advisors, and I am here with Kevin Curley. Kevin, what's going on? Just getting ready for the Fed meeting. Big day yeah. today and tomorrow. Let's see what they say. Fed meetings tomorrow. Expect it to hike one more time and then pause. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what's in store. We can. We'll, we'll jump in that in, in a minute. But let's kick it off with our end of the month pod and go through the usual suspects. So uh, let's just talk about the equity markets. The month of April, how they ended. Bringing you a look at the past month and what may come. Here's the latest financial update. Yeah, the major U.S. markets were basically flat, small caps down a little bit, international up a bit, but pretty quiet April, except for, you know, the second largest bank failure in uh, U.S. history. Other than that, totally quiet. Yeah, pretty quiet, um, albeit a very good month. Uh, yeah, I guess it depends on what, what you're looking at. You know, there's... This is starting to remind me a lot of 2020 um, in regards to a couple of things. One... You know, you look at the S and P and and where it's up uh, year to date. You know, finishing the end of the month last year, uh, excuse me, last month, and we're up. You know, just over eight percent. Uh, the Nasdaq is up <laughs> over over nineteen. Um, and you look under the hood. So I, I'll throw out an interesting stat. You know, I, I feel like you look under the hood, the market's not as good as it looks on paper right now. And there's only a handful of stocks, in, in my opinion, that are driving it. And you look at the SPY, which is the S&P 500 versus RSP, which is the equally weighted S&P 500. The S&P 500 is a market cap index. So a handful of stocks make up the majority of it. And you look at the performance versus the two. And this is the biggest gap we've seen going back to the late 90s. Um, the equally weighted index is up uh, only 2% year to date versus the S&P 500 is up 8.3. So over a 600 point basis point gap um, year to date go, uh, is pretty is pretty wide. And the only time we've seen it wider was the late 90s and 2020. When I mean, you look at Meta up 96%, Nvidia up 88%. I mean, those are two massively weighted companies with massive market cap. Um, and there's there's a bigger list, and it's really just the mega cap mega cap. Uh, tech stocks that are leading the way. For sure. On a performance basis, that's <clears throat> easy to disqualify and, and do that. I think the bigger story and the reason the month was flat to 0%, basically, just a little movement here and there, is U.S. earnings. It's just been a mixed bag. You had a few companies like Pepsi and McDonald's and General Motors, uh, higher prices, big profits, but then are told, well, you guys are just passing on higher prices that you're not affected by input. That's how you're kind of juicing these. But you also have industrial companies like General Electric who said demand for jet engines are good and they raised their forecast. I mean, was last time General Electric had some good news happening. Uh, so we'll see if the price raises are from input or trying to keep margins going. Uh, but it's been a mixed bag. I mean, you had Lyft laying people off, things falling apart for them and Uber doing well. You had Google's sales for advertising decline and Facebook have a positive quarter for the first time in a year. So it's really been a mixed bag and that mixed bag has led to a zero in my book. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, you'll see a lot more of what's what's in store these next couple of weeks with earnings because at the end of the day, you know, the market has to keep delivering on earnings because you look at valuations. I mean, we're we're high right now, um, and I think it's pricing in a lot of good news. It's pricing in good news with the Fed and rates being potentially lower by the end of the year, and it's pricing in uh, good forward earnings. So any hiccup in that, um, you'll see. In my opinion, you'll see you'll see a big sell off. 
Yeah, I think that's fair. And then the, the kind of attitude towards all this has been really negative throughout the year. And what I find is that the attitudes, which is another word for sentiment, is following price. So last year, prices were down. And so people were asked, how are you feeling about next year? And they had a terrible 2022 and said, ah, 2023 is going to be terrible too. Uh, as prices continue to rise, if they do for stock prices like they have so far, you mentioned the NASDAQ up 20, the S&P up 7, uh, the international somewhere in between those two numbers. If that stuff keeps going up and those prices go higher. I think you'll see attitudes improve. You'll suddenly hear, oh, everything's great. Everything's fine. And we can, you know, <laughs> have it go 20% for the whole market. So I think the attitude is very bad. And I think that scars from last year. And the reality on the ground is that stock prices are increasing. You know, I think the big misconception is that, though, they, people are people are talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. And if you have the sentiments at the all time lows and if you look at, you know, the, the bear versus bull spread and I mean, there's a million different metrics you can look at. The sentiment is, is, is low and it was low coming, you know, off of last year. But people are still heavily allocated towards equity more than the historic average. And, you know, there was a good uh, research done by Bespoke about, you know, buying the dip is buying the dip trend back this year. And it looks like it is. Um, it looks like it looks very similar to 2020. I'll throw out another stat. You Bespoke went back, you know, over the last 40 years and just looked at looked at any day the market was up what the average day did. And if the market was down, what the average day did the following day. And if you look at this year, if you invested in a down day, uh, and when we say invested in the S&P 500, the following day, on average, the market was up 0.3%. The only other time we've averaged higher returns the following day after a down day was 2020. Um, and then it, it's reverse for, 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 the, for the other side. If you're buying on an up day, the average day the following day was actually down 0.1%. So you didn't see that big of an uptrend the following day after a down day uh, since 2020. Um, and you can go back to early 1990s. So, you know, small data set, but interesting to look at. And the, the opposite was true last year. If you bought on a down day last year, the following day was actually down by 0.2 percent so yeah it was I think, a tough trend down for sure yeah and i think um i think people got done buying the dip last year and ran out of money to buy and there's a lot of money sitting in money <laughs> they got hurt on that one yeah they got they got hurt and now you're starting <clears throat> to see the the market psyche come back a little bit where people mm -hmm. are starting to 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 buy in the down days so who knows who knows if that's gonna be a continued trend throughout this year yeah, I think uh, there's a couple of things you hit on there is the bad attitude and the buying on down days. Uh, the best example I can give you is the country of France, which we've talked about on our mid-month podcast. They raised the retirement age and there were protests and riots. The country is literally on fire. Somebody broke into their you know, stock exchange, set that on fire. Yet the France index, the CAC 40, all time highs. So, you know, the reality on the street of how people feel and what you know consumers are thinking often has nothing to do with stock market prices. No, and I think and, <laughs> I think a lot of this I think a lot of the sentiment too is is you're starting to feel it in, in home prices and you know you're you're feeling it with inflation, et cetera. But pay, you're not as paper rich as you once were a year and a half ago. I think that's where a lot of it's coming from. Yeah, I you know we'll we'll talk a little bit more about home prices later. I think a good measure of how people are feeling when regards to stocks or bonds is capsulated really well by the firm of BlackRock, one of the largest asset managers in the world, recently come out and said the traditional investing approach of 60% stocks, 40% fixed income, that's just not going to work anymore. You're going to have to do something different. And they called it a new regime based on hiking interest rates by central banks, and it's just not going to work. And this is a firm that, I mean, besides being one of the largest asset managers, it had one of the flagship funds for the last 40 years of this type of 60 40 split uh just being a balanced fund that one of the highest scores within its you know <laughs> sector gets the morning star gold standard all that stuff and now they're saying things are not okay and i i find it hard to believe them uh because for one none of us have a crystal ball but for them to abandon what's worked for 40 years and you could say bond bubble for 40 years sure why not but to, to do that and i would contrast that with what vanguard said they said 60 40 is still fine but your expectations for 
annualized returns should be 6.1%. But that was an increase from where they were a year ago at 3.8% over the next 10 years. So they're saying that portfolio works and here's what you expect. So if you think you can put it in and get six, great. And you're happy with that. But if you were expecting 10, you're really disappointed. Well, I... I agree with the expectations going forward. You know, I know we've talked about this before, but you look at the last decade, 2000, call it 2010 to 20, um, you know, 13 and a half percent averaged annualized returns in the S&P 500 versus the more historic average of seven to eight going over 40 or 50 years back. So, you know, I don't think we're going to continue to see those 13 and a half percent trends. You know, I hope we do, but I think you have to adjust expectations going on a more normalized basis going back over the last 40 or 50 years to that six or seven, where you can now get four and a half percent in a money market and bonds would be somewhat, you know, risk adverse and, and, and safe for the most part. Um, you have your returns from, from the stock market. So I, I don't think uh, the 60, 40 is dead. Last year was obviously the anomaly with rates doing what, what they did. But uh, before we shift gears, so the old adage, sell a May and go away. You know, what are your, what are your thoughts? I, I pulled up some interesting stats on that just to see how accurate it was. Yeah, each of the big asset managers, First Trust is a good example. There's a guy who's their uh, head of chief market technician, I think is his title, over at LPL. They love putting out stats like at the last 30 years, 27 times, it's been positive between May and November um, versus, you know, having a sell-off. I'll throw out a quick stat. So the weakest period of the year, the weakest six months is May through the end of October. And then the right. strongest is obviously November through April. Uh, so just looking at the S&P 500 going back the last 80 years, the average return from the strongest period of the month, uh, which was November through April, you average 6.2%. And the average percent or the percent of the time that it was positive was 75 percent 75 percent of the time and you average 6.2 percent which we just we're, we're just coming out of may through october the average return is three percent and is positive 65 percent of the time now to take it a step further and what i thought was interesting there the averages completely change depending on what it, the market's doing year to date going into May. So in fact, anytime the market was up 5% or more going into May, um, the average was positive almost every single time. The only time you had a negative average was when the market was down 5% or more like it was last year uh, going into May. So this year with where we're at 8% going into May, historically um, it's been up about 4.6%. 78% of the time the next six months. So we'll see if uh, history repeats itself and it holds true. But, you know, sell a May and go away is not always accurate. It really depends on what it looks like going into those six months. And we're looking pretty good right now. Yeah, I think if you did a Mythbusters episode, it would come back as this is a myth. <laughs> Yeah, well, we're gonna we're gonna fact check these, and we're gonna look in November to see what happened over that six month time period, and see if uh, if it held true. Good. Well, the other thing to talk about briefly is the debt ceiling and the Fed meeting. We started off by saying we expect them to raise rates twenty five basis points. To me, they've given no indication they're going to stop. They haven't been out in the newspapers telling everybody this is the last one. In fact, they said the opposite. They're going to keep going as they need to. Um, we saw wage growth tick back up. Um, housing prices may have bottomed and they're starting to rise again. So the Fed raising rates again wouldn't be surprising. So we're going to hold off doing too much on treasuries because the other big news coming is we could have a standoff in the debt ceiling, which is supposed to happen in June. But the Treasury said they can do extraordinary measures to make sure they don't run out of money before September. You saw a major shift in the three-month versus the one-month Treasury bill. <laughs> the interest rate's like a 2% spread. It's wild. And so... There is stress in the market, um, so we'll, we'll reserve judgment for that one. But I do want to go into what the U.S. dollar has been doing lately as well as gold. Do you have any thoughts on treasuries or debt ceiling before we shift gears? Yeah, you know, I'll make one comment, and you're right. The, they're going to announce tomorrow, so we don't want to uh, we don't want to speak before the announcement. And we can we'll do our mid month podcast to just review the the minutes and and everything that we think is going on. But Brian Westbury of First Trust, who's one of the analysts, had a great uh, – put something great out on LinkedIn, directed at our boy Nick um, – what's his last name? Nicky T. Is it Tim Is that how you pronounce it? Tim I, I believe, is how you pronounce it. Tim Arosas. 
Um, he's the. I'm the beginning Fed to learn all the newspaper guys who and gals who sit in that press box. I know about well, Kobe Smith, who's for the FT. I can't remember the lady for the New York Times, but she's. In the, it's uh, bad when we know the journalists asking questions names. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Nikki T, who's the uh, the Fed whisperer, um, and Steve Eisman, who's the the, the mouthpiece for CNBC. Uh, Westbury put out a, a, a tweet directed at them to say, "Hey, stop asking the same questions about how much longer and how, you know the terminal rate and the same questions that we keep asking." He said, "Why don't you ask what happens and where is the Federal Reserve getting their money right now? Mm-hmm. Because right now they are paying more in interest with higher rates than they're receiving, and they don't have any more reserve left. So where is this money coming from?" He said, two, ask them about the money supply. The money supply going, uh, you know, net negative year over year, the fastest decrease since we've seen since the Great Depression. Um, and I'd be curious to see if either of them talk about it or ask about it, but it, especially the first one. I mean, it's a good point. How are you paying all this interest when <laughs> Tom, you're earning Tom, less? Tom. They have a money printer. They just go back and they print the bills and they hand them out to the employees. This is easy. Yeah, no, I know, and I think it's 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 a slight way of trying to call them out to see what the what the response is. But because right now all they're doing is just submitting IOUs, and that gets. But if you had a machine where you could push a button and money just comes out, how many times would you push that button? I'd be pushing it as we speak right now. (laughs) (laughs) So I think that's one of it. The other one, uh, I I think your your point on M two is a good one, and I think you can almost trace it exactly back to the Biden payments that he made to pretty much everybody after the one, the Georgia Senate seat, uh, that inflation that took place correlates really, really strongly with the M2 money supply. And the decrease in that M2's money supply is likely all of that money being spent and now being gone. So we'll see how much inflation was uh, driven by supply chain. I personally think it was a direct result of the fiscal policy. Uh, only because if you look at monetary policy, it was the same worldwide for 15 years. We didn't have any inflation. Then suddenly we hand everybody two grand and we have this major money supply increase as well as inflation increase. So when they write that book in 20 years, I think that'll be the, the conclusion. Oh, they're they're writing it now. It's uh, I, I, I agree with you, too, by the way. I and mean, you couldn't even get inflation above above two percent for 15 years. Years. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the dollar. That's a good transition. It's kind of a. For, for good or bad, this year, gold and dollar uh, are incredibly linked. So if you look at year to date, gold's up about 10%. The dollar's down about 1.5%. But if you just tack on a couple more months and you look at the six-month report, gold's up almost 25% and the dollar's down 8.5%. And you could say a lot of things. Number one, I would say is what's going on here? And if you look at what happened in the past year, uh, the sanctions on Russia, I think, are really driving this ship. If you look at the top buyers of gold in the world, the central banks, nine of the top 10 are in the developing world, which include Russia, India, and China. And you'd have to say why. And apparently the answer is all the sanctions. 30% of countries in the world now face sanctions from the US, the EU, Japan, and the UK. So all of those countries saw what happened with Russia being kicked out of SWIFT, not able to buy or sell their oil, not able to do a lot of things, but they had a ton of assets in gold. And so every central banker in the world, especially those in the developing markets, are buying gold like crazy. And you can see the dollar selling off 58% of reserves at the end of last year at central banks across the world were U.S. dollars, 58%. So their attempt to diversify We've heard about people saying China, but they're less than 3% of reserves. You talk about Japan, but they're in a tougher spot where we are. Uh, the answer is gold. Yeah, I don't, and I don't think I don't think you're having the, the big competition anymore, which is cryptocurrency. That kind of disappeared. I haven't, I haven't heard, I haven't heard. Speaking of disappearing, I think Pam will probably it. delete the word cryptocurrency out of the podcast, from what I understand. Well. Coins, uh, the other virtual coins uh, aren't in existence anymore. Um, no, I, I think I think there's going to be a huge tailwind too. Is if there's any dover speak tomorrow, it's just going to continue to fuel fuel gold. And I think there's just going to be, I think there's this natural flight to safety as well, especially with the banks and to your point, central banks um, buying it up. So I, I, I think you're going to, I think you could see a bigger run in in gold here. Um, 
And you know, the, the biggest just... buyers is hilarious. It's China, Russia, Turkey. I mean, if you're a central banker, you've held U.S. dollars for most of your reserves. You've held a bunch of euros, and now you're buying gold because that's your big diversifier. So if you're an individual and you wanted to ever buy gold, maybe now makes sense only because the central bankers are diversifying their asset base. It could be a pretty compelling case. So I'm just watching heavy buying from them and wondering, you know, they have political concerns, but it just it seems to be very clear. Well, you know, another an opportunity f- to play on gold is the is is the miners themselves, the picks and shovels, as we like to say. And I mean, look at look at those stocks. There's a lot of them are starting to hit new new highs. I mean, the the process on how they mine gold hasn't changed for like a hundred years, by the way. Um, so their costs aren't going up, but the end product they're selling has has skyrocketed. I mean, what are we at an ounce right now? Over two thousand. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. Two thousand fourteen dollars. So- so it, it, it's pretty good, a long way from you know the eleven hundred that we were at not too long ago. So it's almost doubled doubled in price. So we'll keep an eye on that and the relationship with the dollar and and interest rates, which they all play on each other. All right. Um, so real quick on housing, and then I want to talk a little bit about taxes. The housing market it maybe not bottomed, but it stopped going down for the first time in seven months. Uh, could this just be maybe people think the Fed is done raising rates and they're more confident? To me, it's a household formation issue. The number of households being formed in the United States right now is 2 million a year. First housing starts are only one and a half million. You got a 500,000 house gap and it's lagged for a long time because of the 08 crisis specific on housing and financing housing. I think housing prices are just on that alone. I think financing is gonna get tougher, but you got half a million people looking for it. That's a lot of excess demand. So, you, so you're you're making the case that housing prices are going to go going to go down? No, they're going up. They yeah, stopped I, going down. I, I well, I don't. Depends on where you're looking. I mean, year over year, you're still up almost across the board nationally. Um, I mean, there's certain areas like San Francisco and um, other states where people are just flocking because of job growth um, and, and taxes. I th- I think you still have more room to run on the on the housing market. I don't think we've I don't think we've seen it yet. I think you're going to continue to see prices um, go down. I just don't see as long as rates are as high as they are. I don't see and and you mentioned earlier there's a lot of companies that are laying off right now. I don't I don't see that's going to slow down either. I don't think we're going to have this great recession and the housing crisis. But you know I think you'll I think you'll see some more pain in the housing market. Is my personal take. I'm smiling because I just remembered that uh, we had a recently formed new U.S. household here on the pod. I can see his ring right there. Congratulations <laughs> to Tom on his recent marriage. So you're in that statistic. You're one of the 500 households out there looking for a house. Now, I believe you live in an apartment right now. I think once, you know, if <laughs> magic comes and there's a bunch of kids running around, that apartment's going to get real small real fast and you'll be out just like everybody else looking for a house. No, we'll we'll get a bigger apartment and keep getting a bigger apartment. You know, we'll do another <laughs> podcast on re- renting versus buying, and I'm going to make my case on why renting is better than buying a home. But that'll be for another another podcast. Um, so All right. Well, if we can end with taxes, um, I've got a couple things to say. Because <laughs> April was tax day for everybody. Uh, I hope you paid your taxes. I hope all of our clients have done that and at least filed extensions. Uh, there's a lot of talk, and I know – politics has wound down since the midterms, but it's always going to be a hot topic for an election that did you pay your fair share? And so there's a report on tax estimates by income. What they found incomes of a million dollars and above paid 39% of all the taxes paid. And if you tack in people who made 500,000 or more, you have over half the taxes being paid by people who made half a million or more. You say, well, that makes sense. They have the most money. Well, actually their total income from that group is only 22%. Interesting. So when you say pay their fair share, do they, do they go into what, what tax group is, is underpaying versus, versus the other? So there was a Wall Street Journal article called Tax Report by Laura Saunders, and there's a graphic in there from Tristan Wyatt that shows taxpayers earning between 100 and 500 expect to pay ha- ha- get half the income and owe nearly half the total income taxes. So I would say that those people are paying their fair share. If you make between 100 and 500, it pretty much is equal. 
you got 100, you paid a reasonable amount as total income in taxes. It's surprising, though, because the people a million and above who you hear get all the money, I think that's a little bit of a trick and that their assets are appreciating, not actually their incomes are that large because above a million more, that's only 16% of income. They paid 39% of taxes. So I think the simple answer is a lot of long-term gains in there, but I mean, individuals really drive this whole thing as well. So I finished by saying 85% of taxes come from individuals' paychecks. So 54% is individual income tax and 30% is your FICA, your social insurance tax. If you're self-employed, you're paying both sides of it. If you're not, your company pays half and you pay half, but 85% of the money. So when you're voting, you are actually the guys who are funding the politicians who are spending your money. Corporate tax is only 8% of the total amount of federal revenue. That's it, 8%. I thought it would be yeah. a lot more than that. And estate taxes, you know, all the billionaires who pass away, less than half of, well, like, it's like half of 1% for all that stuff. So it's, you know, we'll it's do, us. We're paying. We'll have to do an <laughs> They're spending our actually. money. Well, because the, the billionaires already have all their, their trust and their limited partnerships already set up. So, yeah, they're never going to pay that tax. That's all getting passed on tax free. Um, so that does not surprise me, but the corporate tax does. Um, well, that's good. Uh, that's good insight. So yeah, hopefully everyone did pay their taxes because if you haven't, they're overdue. Um, and make sure you're making estimates for those yeah. who that are self-employed. And if you need help with some tax planning, we at Global Wealth Advisors do tax planning. So give us a call or hit us an email. Uh, what's that email address, Tom? Info at gwadvisors.net. We will happily help you make sure you pay the right amount, but hopefully you are investing and saving the most tax efficient way possible. All right. Well, that ends it. We'll uh, see you on the mid-month podcast. Thanks, Kevin. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets. Five, four, three, two... One. Kevin, you there? I can hey. still hear you, Tom. Oh, you just completely disappeared. Um, That's weird. Like you blacked out, and I couldn't hear you. <laughs> God, we gotta get. We got gotta get. Will something. Ferrell, an old school situation going. We, we gotta get something. We gotta get a new a new software. Let me write let me write this down for Pamela. Ten. Yeah, 10, it 4, says 5. we're paused at minute ten twenty eight. Says we're paused. The top right, it's no longer actively recording. Oh, I don't know says, if you... Mine says recording. You you don't have a counter like you usually do, you said? Okay. All right, now there's two of you. Yeah, it's weird. I only see myself, but then it has that there's two of us and one in the audience. <laughs> All right, let me stop this.